Thank you so much for coming to our presentation of our new report. Uh, my name is Claire Demers. I'm the Director of Federal Policy at the Pemina Institute. Je vais faire ma présentation en anglais, mais je suis heureuse de prendre des questions en français s'il y a des questions en français. So our report is called Getting on Track for 2020, and it deals with recommendations for greenhouse gas pollution from the oil and gas sector. So we're going to walk through a deck very quickly and, uh, and then hopefully leave it open for some questions. So in terms of context, um, we are just start, start off with the commitments that we have right now. So in 2010, the federal government adopted a climate, a national GHG greenhouse gas target. Uh, that's a target that the government says is aligned with the United States. It's the same target as the United States. So that is the overall context. Then underneath of that national target, uh, the government has talked about regulating sector by sector Canada's economy. A couple of those sectors have already happened. They've done regulations for vehicles and for coal-fired electricity. The one we're talking about today is oil and gas, and the government committed in 2011 to write regulations for the oil and gas sector. So they have been, Environment Canada has been working on those regulations since 2011 uh, and has convened a group of industry and the government of Alberta which is working away on that development and the Environment Minister has said we'll see something public by the middle of this year. So just a final piece of context, always good to see where Canada's greenhouse gas pollution comes from and obviously the wedge we're talking about today is that 22% from the oil and gas sector. So what is it going to take to have effective regulations for the oil and gas sector? First of all, let's look at why we should have those. So from our perspective, probably not a big surprise as a sustainable energy group, we think it's really important to deal with climate change. We think that's good news for Canadians, it's good news for the world. However, we also think strong regulations are good news for the oil and gas industry itself. This is an industry that has been under the microscope. Uh, it is facing more and more scrutiny of its environmental track record. And having strong regulations in place would help to answer its critics, uh, would help to increase public support for the sector's operations. And people refer to that by the term social license to operate. So that's one benefit. Uh, it also would create an incentive to innovate, flexibility, gives companies more certainty about the rules of the game. So we think this is having strong regulations is good news all around. Now, just to be clear, you know, in these recommendations we are publishing today, we worked within the framework set by the Harper government, and that means sector by sector regulations. However, that is not our preference. What we think makes the most sense for Canada would be an economy-wide price on greenhouse gas pollution. That's more economically efficient, it gives you a better chance of achieving your environmental ambition, it's simpler. That I think is the tool that really does need to come back on the table in the federal discussion. But for today, we looked at the framework that the government has, has handed us and that the government is working within. So sector by sector regulations. And we also worked within the government's 2020 target. So as I mentioned, this is the target they adopted in 2010. Many would argue that Canada should take a stronger target. But the reality is, at this point in time, meeting that 2020 target that the government has set out would be a big step because, excuse me, we are currently very far from being on track to hit that target. And we have a picture to illustrate that right here. So this comes from Environment Canada. The key line from our perspective is that purple line in the middle that says 720 million tons. That is where Canada's emissions are projected to be in 2020 after factoring in all provincial climate policies, you know, provincial carbon pricing, significant provincial initiatives, plus all the federal regulations that have already been put in place. So that is where we are headed, and it's a growth from today's level. Uh, the one that we're talking about today is that little yellow line at the bottom, 607 million tons. That's Canada's 2020 target. And the gap between the two of them is 113 million tons. That is a significant gap. Uh, 
it is more than the total emissions of Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and New Brunswick combined. It's more than all the current emissions from Canada's electricity sector. It's a big gap. This slide shows a little bit about why we have that gap. So just to explain, uh, the top line in red is where our emissions are projected to be. The one underneath it that heads off to the left, our national target, so that's where we need to go. And all of the little lines in blue are different sectors of the economy. And the one that jumps out at you midway through is the oil sands. So the oil sands, that is the projected growth from 2010 to 2020. It is extremely significant. The fastest growing sector in Canada's economy and a large part of the reason why we are not on track to hit that 2020 target. So as, as I mentioned, uh, that gap includes existing policies and oil and gas. So that 22% of the total pie uh, is a big piece of what's left. This is what we need to help close that gap and get on track to our target. So what is that going to take? So what we did, we crunched some numbers. We looked at what the other sectors that have yet to be regulated could achieve. And then we thought they could close about a quarter of the gap. So what's left, three quarters of the gap, is what we assigned to oil and gas. So we said oil and gas, to get Canada on track, needs to close that three quarters of the gap. And that means improving their greenhouse gas emissions performance by 42% relative to where they would otherwise be in 2020. So that's a big number. And we've got the details there in terms of what it means in absolute emissions. Uh, it's obviously a significant change from business as usual. And that's what we show in the next slide. So under business as usual, they're projected to grow. And then that dotted line is where we think they need to get to uh, to get Canada on track for its 2020 target. So one of the benefits of doing this is that there are some cleaner fuels policies proposed in the European Union, in California, that have garnered a lot of attention from the oil sands and the oil and gas sector. And that is because it is a higher emissions fuel. It's hard right now for them to compete if those policies move ahead. Now, what we're recommending would actually more than have the gap between the oil sands and conventional crudes. So it puts them on a much better footing to compete uh, in a world where countries and jurisdictions are moving towards wanting to see better environmental performance and cleaner fuels. So I think that's one of the significant benefits of what we're recommending today. Is this realistic? Obviously, this is a significant change from what the sector is looking at right now. Uh, I think it's safe to say it's more ambitious than what most companies operating in the sector would be asking for. However, when we were doing our research on this report, one of the things that jumped out at us is this is actually very similar to what the government projected would happen under a proposal that they tabled in 2007-2008 with John Baird was then the environment minister. It was called Turning the Corner. And the numbers in Turning the Corner, they were looking at a 37% emissions improvement from the oil and gas sector for a total of 83 million tons. And we are looking at a 42% reduction, total of 86 million tons, very much in that same ballpark. So from our perspective, this means energy companies have had years of heads up that this kind of level of improvement might be required of them, that this kind of thing is potentially on the table. So this should not come as a surprise to anybody. Uh, and we know, in fact, that a lot of companies already think through the implications of potential uh, greenhouse gas pollution policies when they decide whether a project should go ahead or not. So applying Alberta's model. The reason we need to talk about this is it's our understanding that the federal government is taking a really close look at the system that the government of Alberta put in place in 2007. And Alberta's system covers not just oil and gas, but all the heavy industry uh, facilities in that province. And from what we understand, this is something that the federal government is looking at as a potential model for its oil and gas regulations. So it's important to understand the pros and cons of what Alberta's doing. And what we did was we, we looked at that model and said, okay, what would this mean if we were to apply it to the oil and gas sector? 
and we looked at it through that lens of what's it going to take to get Canada on track for its 2020 target. So there's three main parameters in Alberta's regulation that set its stringency. And so we, this just gives a little bit of a heads up of what the system looks like. One of those is that Alberta's system is an intensity-based system. So that means it does not put an absolute cap on greenhouse gas pollution. Uh, instead, it asks companies to, for example, improve their emissions performance per barrel of oil produced. And one of the implications of that is that Alberta's greenhouse gas pollution has actually been growing in the years since they put this system into effect. So they set a target of 12% emissions intensity improvement. And as we've talked about, the target we're looking at for the oil and gas sector is significantly stronger, 42%. Another aspect of Alberta's approach is what's called the technology fund. So they allow companies, rather than improving their emissions performance in their own facilities, companies can pay, and the rate of payment is $15 a ton, into a fund. And that fund is then spent on cleaner emissions technology. So we understand this is something that Ottawa is looking at. Uh, a couple of implications of that approach. One is that Obviously, you have to collect the money, then you decide where it goes. There's an arm's length corporation that does that. Then it goes out to projects. The projects have to get off the ground. All of this means the emission reductions, if they happen, happen well into the future. Uh, and the other implication is this technology usually costs much more than $15 a ton. So you're not going to get a ton of emissions reduced for every $15 paid in. So when we looked at what this might mean, federally. We said, well, if Ottawa allows companies in the oil and gas sector access to this kind of a technology fund, what price should they charge? And again, for us, it comes back to what do we need to get Canada on track for its 2020 target? So there's economic modeling out there that answers that question. So we did some uh, with the David Suzuki Foundation back in 2009, found you'd need at least $100 a ton to get on track for the target. More recently, the National Roundtable on the Environment and the Economy in 2012, they calculated you're going to need $150 a ton uh, to get on track for the target. So what we're recommending for the oil and gas sector in the federal approach is if there's a technology fund, the price needs to be on that order of $100 a ton uh, to be in the ballpark of getting Canada on track. And if you really want to make sure you hit the target, $150 a ton. Uh, is the right number according to the National Roundtable and on the environment and the economy. Those numbers obviously sound big, so we put them in context. So this slide here, we looked at some existing climate policies. So we looked at Alberta's approach, which is called the SGER, that's the Alberta model we've been talking about. Uh, the BC carbon tax, that already exists, uh, it's $30 a ton today. And Norway's carbon tax, which has different rates for different sectors, their oil and gas sector rate, which we've got there, is $71 a ton. So when you look at what that works out to, uh, the maximum that a company might have to pay, and then we also have that final column, the effective average cost per barrel. That means the price signal that companies actually see after they account for what happens when they discount this against the royalties uh, or the corporate taxes that they pay. And that effectively cuts the cost to companies in half. So our recommended approach, when you look at the 100 or the $150 a ton, bottom line, the biggest number we've got there in that what companies actually see column uh, is less than $3 a barrel. So putting that in context, these are barrels that currently sell for about $70. Uh, that is more than BC's current carbon tax, but it's less than Norway is already charging to its oil and gas sector. So we think that you know shows there are some live examples where companies are prospering uh, and doing just fine under this type of a more stringent approach. Last thing I want to highlight from Alberta, the treatment of offset credits. And an offset is an emission reduction that comes from outside the sectors that are being regulated. So it could be from a really small project or from a farm or that type of thing. Uh, Alberta gives companies, they can meet a percent of their target through purchasing these offset credits. And in fact, that was a very popular option for companies in Alberta to meet their targets. 
But the reality is it's really, really hard to design an offset system that has bulletproof environmental integrity. And in fact, that's been the case in Alberta. Their Auditor General has raised a number of concerns about the offsets in, in that jurisdiction. Uh, some of them come from things that were already industry standard practice or for things that were already happening before the regulation took place. So they may not actually go beyond business as usual. So what that means is a government that wants to be prudent, that wants to make sure you actually get on track, is going to need to limit companies' access to offsets. Uh, so don't allow companies to hit 100% of their target with these credits. Also, there are other ways, for example, setting a fixed price to avoid the incentive to go out and find cheap and thus low quality uh, emission reduction. So we've recommended a number of ways that the government should manage this risk. If they allow companies access to offsets, make sure uh, that they do not have that, you know, 100% exposure to the risk of offsets. So we conclude uh, with a couple of slides here that look at key questions that I hope people like you and certainly people like us will be asking when the federal government does unveil these regulations. But let me just quickly, uh, since we do have a, a moment, uh, highlight some of the, the, you know, the real takeaways from writing this report and from our analysis. So as you can see, oil and gas, the oil sands sector in particular, this is really the litmus test for the federal government's sector-by-sector -sector approach. And right now, there are no constraints from the federal government on greenhouse gas pollution from that sector. As we mentioned, Canada is nowhere near getting on track to hit its targets. So getting this right is a make or break moment for Canada's climate credibility. Get it right, we could get on track to hit the target as we've outlined here. Uh, get it wrong and it becomes very, very difficult to close that really significant gap to hit our 2020 target. As we said, the sector can take responsibility for its greenhouse gas pollution for about $3 a barrel on barrels that sell for about $70. And tough regulations are good news that can help the sector compete uh, in a world where environmental performance really matters and matters more and more. So I'll stop there uh, and happy to take any questions. Thank you. 42% reduction. How achievable is that? Does the technology exist to allow companies to be able to mm. achieve that kind of aggressive target? Yeah, absolutely. So the technology certainly exists, um, and having a target like that in place would also spur further innovation. I mean, one of the main technologies that companies would look to would be carbon capture and storage. And we're seeing, for example, uh, there's an upgrader in Alberta, the Shell Quest project, that's going to be applying that technology. So the technologies are there. I think what the industry would say is the time period is tough, right? Getting a project like that built, permitted, through all the approvals is difficult between now and 2020. You know, 2020 is just around the corner from uh, an industry timeline perspective. So I think that is part of the reason why we've talked about some of these so-called flexibility mechanisms, things like a technology fund or offsets. These are things that raise concerns for us because they do make it less difficult to be certain about the environmental outcome that you're going to get from the regulations. But they also allow the government to put in place an ambitious target and not, you know, if industry comes and says, our hands are tied, there's nothing we can do between now and 2020. No, there are answers. There are approaches where they can say, you know, trade with other companies, invest in the technology fund or whatever. So the time frame does not have to be a constraint, doesn't have to set the bar. In fact, you know, from our perspective, the right answer to those concerns about, well, what can we really do in our facilities between now and 2020? Send a strong signal so that companies do as much as they can. And the reality, regulators have found over and over, right? It's all going to be very, very hard until you make a regulation. And then suddenly companies will take the lobbyists off the table, bring on the engineers, they unleash that innovation, and suddenly you're seeing all kinds of new technologies come forward. But also, the approach that we're talking about today means that not all of the reductions have to take place within the physical operations of companies. So it's not what they can literally physically do between now and 2020 does not have to set a ceiling on the ambition uh, of the potential federal regulations. The 2020 target without this kind of significant reduction, if they came out with a 
percent. Would that essentially mean, from your perspective, there's no way they meet 2020 targets? So I think that's the key question about these regulations, right? From our view, this is really make or break moment for that 2020 target. Right now, you know, we are nowhere near hitting it. There's a, a gap larger than the entire emissions from the electricity sector. That's a really significant gap to close. Oil and gas, you know, whatever you do in, a, in the sector by sector approach. So, for example, we've already seen the government has made their announcement in terms of, for example, coal power. That means from their perspective, that's already factored in to this gap. So, you know, if we also take an approach with oil and gas that's weak, then it becomes very, very difficult to see how those sectors that remain, which are much smaller, can close that gap under the sector by sector approach. So from our perspective, this is fundamental to whether or not Canada can hit the 2020 target. Now, I don't want to say that if they get this wrong, they're not going to hit the target. But what it means is that you have to go beyond the sector by sector approach. You've got to find other emission reductions. So for example, if you look at vehicles, right, there's already regulations federally in place on vehicles. You could do other things to get more emission reductions from that sector. You could invest more in public transit, for example. You know, so when we look at this, one of the main tools that we would love to see come back into the discussion is economy-wide carbon pricing. You know, that would complement a sector-by-sector -sector regulatory approach. But it's it's absolutely from our perspective and what the math tells us is that this is really this is the litmus test for the sector-by-sector -sector approach. Get it wrong and it becomes very, very difficult to see how you meet the rest of this target with that approach. Um, I, was, I was just wondering yeah. if you had a, any reaction to the announcement of Transit Canada this morning about the mm. rest of these. That is partly why Nathan's here. So we, I'm going to hand over to our pipeline expert, Nathan Lesson. Ask a, a question on the subject of the day because I'm yeah. also interested in, in this subject, but maybe to finish on the. Uh, on so your should we do all questions on regs sure. and then yeah. go to pipeline? So Would you mind? Steps, so let's try to get into sure. I had a question about the. Is that something that's centrally administered that the federal in Alberta? government would look after? So uh, we don't know what the federal government's going to propose uh, in terms of a technology fund. In the Alberta approach, it's an arm's length. Uh, operation. So it's called uh, the CCEMF, so the Climate Change and Emissions Management Fund, and it operates. They collect the money, uh, or government collects the money, hand it over to the fund, they do requests for proposals, and send it out the door that way. We can maybe move on to the other sure. side, but how confident are you this government is interested in implementing ambitious targets like this in, in, in light of its rhetoric on carbon tax? The rhetoric on carbon taxes is very concerning to us. You know, as I mentioned, it's a it's a policy tool that all the experts agree makes a huge amount of sense. It's economically efficient. It's environmentally strong. You know, we think it has to come back into the discussion. So I think the government's decision to talk about it as you know just a terrible idea that nobody should implement is very very unfortunate. Um, in terms of what they're going to do with oil and gas. You know, obviously there are real reasons to be concerned about how serious the government is. And I, I share all of those concerns. But uh, we are at a moment where I think it's become clear, even to people who may not have seen this, you know, a few months ago, that environmental performance matters for the oil and gas sector, for them to be able to compete in a world where we're moving to low carbon fuel standards, we're seeing them going forward, you know, they're facing all kinds of public questions because of their environmental record. So you hear things like some of the, the ministers or the premiers that have gone to the United States recently and you know, done this lobbying in favor of, for example, the Keystone Pipeline have come back and said, all right, it's clear that uh, it's not about, we don't need to come and talk about jobs, we don't need to come and talk about energy security, we need to come and talk about the environment. So. I think it's crystal clear, it should certainly be crystal clear, that getting this stuff right is important, that a lot of people are going to be watching this, and that this is critical for the future of the sector in Canada. Uh, whether the government will actually respond appropriately, we don't know, right? We're releasing this report today to try and set some of those benchmarks of 
what an appropriate regulation looks like. But we'll see whether they've really heard the message that, uh, that we hope is coming from the critics of the sector. Indication that would lead you to believe that maybe they will listen this time? It's too soon to say, right? I mean, what's, what's been happening right now is Environment Canada, at this moment in time, their work on the regulations is being done behind closed doors. Uh, they have a working group that involves members of the oil and gas industry and the province of Alberta. So, you know, I'm, I'm not privy to what that working group is considering. Um, so we'll have to see. From what we've seen from ministers, for example, you know, at this point in time, it's been more a case of saying our environmental record is just fine, uh, which is a concern, right? I mean, what I would hope is to see the government recognize that being off track by 113 million tons for your 2020 target is a concern and that they will find ways to close that gap. But, you know, you got to be optimistic working in this business. So I do hope that we're at a moment where people see the importance of getting this right. And, you know, I really, it's, I think it's very clear what needs to be done. There's been a huge amount of analysis. Government's been working away at this for years and years and years. And so it's not a question of not having the information. Uh, it's a question of whether they decide that this is a priority and that we need to close the gap and find the will to act. Now, I know there were pipeline questions also. All right. Just, just in general, just wanted to get uh, Prime Minister's reaction to the news this morning by the Transit Forum the West East. Sorry, just trying to get my papers over there. Well, it, it, it's certainly good to see uh, that Trans Canada is starting to do their homework and seek out uh, commercial support before they go ahead with any sort of application for the pipeline itself that runs in contrast to Enbridge, which went forward with their, uh, with their application before they even have any proven commercial support. But it's important to remember that this is just the beginning of the process for TransCanada. They have uh, uh, several months to, to confirm the shipper's support. They intend to file their application by the end of the year, but that starts uh, then the application process, which is another 15 months. And if everything goes up according to plan, maybe by the end of, of uh, 2017, 2018, they may be able to have this pipeline operational. But in the meantime, there's uh, a number of concerns that uh, TransCanada needs to address and that the governments of Alberta and Canada need to address before they could put forward uh, additional oil sands pipelines. And certainly some of the things that we raised today around federal uh, greenhouse gas regulations for the oil and gas sector is a key component of ensuring that the development that does occur is responsible. I just given it's such a beginning stage, what did you think then of Minister Oliver's sort of announcement welcoming this, this uh, securing jobs for Atlantic Canada and Eastern Canada for the future? Well, it, it uh, is a little premature. Yeah, it, it's a little premature for Minister Oliver to be making these announcements. Uh, if you could remember back a number of years ago, he made the similar announcements for Northern Gateway as well, and that's uh, still many, many years off from ever being realized, if it is realized at all. Um, so there's a number of hurdles, especially around social license, about getting um, the support from the public, from communities along the, the pipeline route, uh, from Aboriginal communities and the environmental community as well. That's key to ensuring um, future infrastructure like pipelines get built. And right now, uh, it's hard to make the case that the oil sands and the pipelines can happen responsibly in the absence of, of key policies like uh, like uh, strong climate regulations. If we can square the circle because it's got aggressive promotion of a number of pipelines, Keystone, Northern Gateway, this Trans-Canada one, and uh, yet at the same time it says it is going to be imposing some uh, emissions. And in this 42% you're talking about, that's the current baseline. So what happens if we see expansion of the oil, of the oil patch? Is, that, is it going to be tougher to meet whatever targets we set? Well, that 2020 figure accounts for uh, growth in the oil sands uh, production as, as projected by, um, by industry. So, uh, so that takes into account uh, up to 2020. But if you look at where uh, the industry is projected to go, it's much, much higher. It's well over 3 million barrels a day by 
2035, there's already five and a quarter million barrels a day of oil sands production already approved. So if the oil sands were to develop faster than that, obviously you would need to be able to have even stronger uh, climate regulations to ratchet down those emissions. Do you have any uh, idea of the impact, and I understand your projections take into account the projections of oil sands growth, but do you have any uh, idea of just how much this one pipeline, which has a capacity or would have a capacity of 850,000 barrels a day, just how much greenhouse gas emissions it single-handedly would create? Any uh, well, I, because the Trans-Canada announcement is very new, I, I haven't run the uh, numbers on that, but it's very similar to what TransCanada is proposing. It's 830,000 uh, down with Keystone XL. Um, and that would be uh, the equivalent emissions of uh, over 4 million cars on the road.